Good. Hola, bon dia. My team member said to start with these words. I have no idea what they mean. I hope it's something good. <laughs> so um, thank you all for showing up so early. Uh, for the Spanish people, this must still be in the middle of the night. I'm quite sure. <laughs> for me, it's almost lunchtime as a Dutch person. <laughs> Um, and uh, thank you for, uh, for walking through this very refreshing weather that you are enjoying here in Barcelona. People have been uh, telling me uh, since uh, a day or two, oh my God, we're so sorry for receiving you in weather like this, and, and, and it's raining badly. I said, what rain? <laughs> I'm from the Netherlands. <laughs> And I, I think I noticed a slight increase in, hum, in humidity in the air. <laughs> I was, in, uh, I was in, <clears throat> in France last week, in Nice, and, they, uh, and they told, oh, it had been raining badly. They said it had been pouring. There was, there was 10 centimeters of, 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 uh, of water in the streets, and one French guy even managed to drown in that. <laughs> and, and I said, this is a drizzle <laughs> for Dutch people. So, um, anyways, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for keeping the Sagrada Familia in the same place every time I come back. It helps me navigate. <laughs> it's in, in Paris, it's very different. The Notre Dame is somewhere else every time I, 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 I'm there. It's amazing. It's very difficult navigating around Paris. So, it's good to be here <clears throat> in, in Barcelona. And this talk is, about, uh, is, uh, is called Workout. Indeed, my previous two books... Our, our management 3.0 and and how to change the world and uh, I've been I've been traveling a lot ever since I wrote that first book which indeed as uh, as you just heard is about the role of the manager in agile organizations and uh, everywhere I go people people ask me uh, questions such as uh, Jurgen can you can you explain how can we motivate our our workers how can we change the organization's culture how can we um, change the mindset of managers, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. How can we develop people's competencies? Um, do you, does anyone see the the pattern across these questions? What is what is similar across us all these questions that you see here? Anyone? They start with how can we? You're so brilliant. This audience is amazing. They all start with how can we? <laughs> yes. And except for that, what else is similar across the questions? Yes, very good. Blaming others, changing other people. So the question is, how can we change? How can we change them, Jurgen? Let me put this a bit, a little, a little bit like this. So how can we? How can we change them? Not changing ourselves. No, 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 no. We know what we should be doing, <laughs> what we want to be doing. We want to change them. So I thought maybe this is part of the problem. Maybe this, if, if, if everyone is trying to manipulate everyone else, no wonder that we're not solving any problems. That's, that's something that occurred to me. So I set out to find things that we can do ourselves to change our organizations, to lead by example, to introduce ideas next week, to inspire others. And then hopefully when we set the right example, people are able to, uh, to follow us. So that's the idea of, of the third book that I've been writing. And I keep saying uh, uh, this is for everyone. Management is too important to leave to the managers. Everyone is managing something, I am quite sure. I am, uh, I've been a manager for 15 years in various companies. I've been uh, doing other things for the last three years, being a facilitator and a writer and a licensor, etc. But I'm always managing something. There's a lot of things to manage. So I'm, I'm sure that applies to many people in organizations. So this is, uh, these are workout practices, as I call them, for, uh, for everyone. And um, <clears throat> I found, when my travels around the world, I found um, uh, co-pilot programs, culture videos, uh, employee photo walls, many other things, happiness rooms. That was one in, uh, at InfoJobs, by the way, in, uh, here, in, here in Spain. And uh, there's one thing similar across all of these. I'm not going to talk about any of them. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just going to show you how good my book looks. This is how amazing my book looks. You see that? Awesome. <laughs> this is uh, Anders from Spotify. I've been there two years ago. Amazing office. I'll just show you some more pages of my book. This is going to take 45 minutes, by the way. 
nice pictures, nice illustrations. Oh, it's so beautiful. That is a horse. That was my horse. It was a very angry horse, I can tell you, in Chile. Yes, it's, uh, it, I'm very proud of that book. And I made it uh, together with uh, Linda. <coughs> Linda is my designer, my creative designer. And um, I, uh, I realized after working with Linda for two years that I didn't really know a lot about her. I just knew that she was an amazing designer. That, that was basically it. So I told myself, hmm, maybe she, uh, I should know a bit more about Linda. By the way, this is Linda in Bali, working really hard on my book in Bali, as you can see. Probably my, my, the, her notebook is somewhere there in the grass. This is Linda working really hard in Japan on my book. This is uh, Linda waiting for my next chapter in Thailand. Linda feeling very inspired in Turkey while designing my book. Uh, Linda hiding in Iran because some, something I wrote in my book that she didn't want to be catch the, caught with, probably. Um, so Linda has been traveling all over the world. That's one thing that I know of Linda is that she travels a lot. Clearly, that's, she travels a lot over here. So I created this personal map of, of what do I know about Linda, because I didn't know her very well. Well, she travels. Um, she's in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, that's where she's from. I know that because that's where I'm from as well. Um, she has dogs, I saw that on Facebook, uh, good to know. And uh, she has a husband. That was all. My God, <laughs> that's bad. I knew so little about the person I've been working with for two years. Only a few, few items on the, on, the, on the personal map. So I said, Linda, this, this, this needs to change. and We need to know, get to know each other a little better. So you know, I invited her for dinner. Uh, in, in Rotterdam, and, uh, and we had a great, uh, great conversation, and I picked up that actually um, she is, uh, as I thought, she was a vegan. No, she's a vegetarian. All right, good. We have, the, we have changed that. Um, and uh, her husband is called Fahid. <coughs> she is from Iran, and he's trying, she's trying to import her husband from Iran into the Netherlands. My God, that's difficult. That's difficult. That's such a problem. Never, never. This is one takeaway of this keynote. Never find your husband in Iran. It's better to find him in, in Spain or whatever. <laughs> but Iran, that's, that's very difficult. Anyway, she's trying. And, um, uh, and that's what, that was the first 15 minutes of our dinner conversation. The other two hours of our dinner conversation were about how she met her husband in Thailand. I think I need uh, three more dinner conversations to fill the entire, uh, entire personal map. <laughs> so I, was, um, I show you the personal map because I was, uh, I was very inspired two years ago when uh, I was in Spain at the Agile Lean Europe conference. Some of you might remember that one. That was in, uh, uh, that was in Madrid, if I am yeah. was it, in, it was in the Barcelona. I don't, Barcelona, Barcelona. Yeah, I'm confusing it with XP. It was in Barcelona. And, uh, and uh, Jim McCarthy was speaking at that conference, and he had something that inspired me. He said, you guys have one thing wrong in the Agile community. You're always focusing on co-location. But that is not the point, he said. The point is not getting people together uh, physically or geographical closeness. He said, the point, the goal is mental closeness between people. So they be become friends, that they are able to hang out with each other, that they know a lot about each other's personalities and, and, and everything. Because then they work better. And getting people together in one room is just one way of achieving it. Yes, it is a good practice, but it may not work for everyone. Actually, the trend is the opposite. People spread out. Flex time, remote workers, distributed teams, globalization, people are all over the planet. It doesn't make sense to tell everyone, you should be in one room. Yeah, right. This is the 21st century. Wake up. Right. We need other practices to, to getting people to get, uh, working together well. So one of them is, 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 I believe, drawing a mind map of another person or of yourself. And then and, and, uh, realizing that you know so little about the other person. I do, this, uh, I do an exercise with the personal maps at the start of my workshops. It's fun. It's a great icebreaker. People are, have, are required to introduce each other instead of, instead of themselves. It's much more interesting. And then people see patterns across the, across the personal maps. Oh, you have the same hobbies as I have, or you come from the same place. You, you, like, uh, you like the same kinds of vacation destinations or whatever. These are just some of the, 
some pictures of the personal maps I took during my classes. A picture of a person taking a picture of the, of the personal maps. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure someone took a picture of me at that same moment. And um, I have uh, people sending me now pictures from all over the world. I had one that's very amazing, was from San Francisco, a friend of mine. He said he, he did it with his team in his office where they had big whiteboard walls that you could write on. And he had his team create their personal maps all over the office walls. And they had great fun, he said. It was an awesome team exercise. They were drawing connections between it, each other. And he, he sent me a photo of it. And I asked, can I, put, can I put that photo in my book? That looks awesome. And then he asked his team members, and his team said, mm, no, 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 no. This is private information. This is personal information. We, you cannot share it. And I really respected that. Because that meant that they had been sharing personal information with each other that I, should, that I shouldn't know about. So I, 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 really, I really complimented uh, them on, on that. Good team. So personal apps, that's something that you can be doing next, uh, next week. But I have more suggestions, more ideas that I, that I picked up from all over the world. Another one is, um, um, is uh, um, uh, about, uh, about appreciation. Uh, I appreciate the people who helped me with my book. I did, a, I did a call for beta readers um, uh, half a year ago or something, a little bit more, more than half a year ago. I asked people, who wants to be a beta reader of my, of my new book? 100 people offered themselves. Oh my God, that's far too much. I know from experience, 15 is about the number that I can, that I can handle. Getting feedback from 15 people, that's, that's a lot. So I thought, how do I select 15 from 100? I don't know. I thought, maybe, maybe I should just have them select themselves. So I said, okay, this is going to be really, really tough. I want you to review 100,000 words from this date until that date. And I needed a steady, sequen steady uh, stream of feedback from you. Uh, and I gave some more requirements. Are you able to do this? 50 people said yes. All right, good. I had got rid of 50 people. <laughs> 50 people left who said, yes, I really want to do that. So I thought, okay, well, just let's get started. I sent the first chapter to the first 50 people and only 25 sent me feedback. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> 50 people said, yes, I'm going to do it. And only 25 people said, uh, uh, send me uh, results. And then we moved on uh, with the next chapters. Halfway, about 15 people were still, uh, were still uh, uh, hanging on. They persisted. And at the end, I had seven people left. They had done uh, almost, uh, almost everything. So the average was about 15, that is exactly as I needed, <laughs> which is great. And um, this, I'm not trying to, to blame anyone. I'm not, not trying to, be, to, be, uh, to, to, to accuse uh, the, the people who signed up because I appreciate that they are enthusiastic. I just notice, and this is a pattern all over the world, that people eagerly say yes, but then don't follow through. It is very easy to get commitment from people. It is hard to get results, as I have noticed. So getting yes is the easy part. There's a book that says getting to yes. Well, that's the easy part. <laughs> getting them to do something, that is, that is difficult. And something that organizers of and, and, and managers of volunteer organizations know, know all about. But I was appreciative of the people who, uh, who tried, at least, of course. So I sent them some kudo cards. Thank you. For, uh, for joining, thank you for signing up as a beta reader. I thank thanks for, for the translators of my, of my book, um, uh, everyone who gave title uh, suggestions. And these are, uh, these are kudos, these are kudo cards. I picked up the practice in Poland, where uh, there's a company, uh, Lunar Logic, where they have uh, a box where they put kudo cards, tokens of appreciation in the box. And every person who receives a card gets a little present. That's very nice. Uh, box of chocolates, uh, uh, dinner for two, movie tickets, whatever. This is actually a picture from a company in, in Britain, by the way. They call it the shout-out shoe box, but it's the same practice. Put the tokens of appreciation in there, and the winners get a, get a nice, uh, sometimes they get a nice present. I know other companies, they have walls, uh, kudo walls. This is also something that I do in my, in my workshops. We, we put them on the wall so it's more visible, everyone who received the compliment. And for me, that makes a lot of sense, because this is about focusing on the good thing. I noticed that again and again from, from experts. Sometimes they call it focus on your strengths, 
or it is called uh, systems thinking, uh, focusing on good things, make the bad things uh, go away, or appreciative inquiry. There are lots of, lots of ideas, methods, and gurus who have the same suggestions. Focus on the good stuff, because if you more focus more on good stuff, you get more good things. If you focus on mistakes and errors and problems, you just get more mistakes and errors and problems. Maybe they will go away all by themselves if you stop, if you stop messing with them all the time. So these are some uh, pictures of, uh, of Kudo walls that I, uh, uh, that I have, Kudo cards. And uh, it's another thing that you can do next week. You don't even have to attach a little present. Just the token of appreciation is for some people already enough. I had someone in my workshop two or three weeks ago. She said, I have been in your two-day class three years ago and I still have the Kudo cards that the people gave me back then. Because that's so awesome. I still have them on my monitor on my, uh, in my office. So apparently that's important for, uh, for people. But I have more ideas. Here's a message that I got from, uh, from Betsy. Betsy uh, uh, had, uh, had been reading my book and she said, your English is remarkably good. Betsy is obviously a very intelligent and perceptive person. You can see that. You have an incredible feel for the rhythm and idiom of English and you're doing a magnificent job and the text is a pleasure to read. I love Betsy. <laughs> Oh, I love this message. It's, um, it's above my bed. <laughs> I am so thankful of, of her having sent me this, uh, this email. And, and notice, by the way, that Betsy is one of the few people in the world who knows how to spell the word idiom. Because usually when people send me an email, they misspell it with a, with a T at the end, which is, of course, incorrect. Right? Thank you. I'm glad you got it. All right. Next question, uh, next uh, compliment. Your art and ability to capture ideas is really fantastic. Just scrolling through is a buffet for the brain. Carol must be a poet or something. <laughs> I love it. A buffet for the brain. Awesome. And, uh, and here's a third one from Hamed in Iran. For some reason, Iran is a theme in this talk. I have no idea why. But um, My thanks for your astonishing book. Every page I read makes me wish to become a manager someday. Oh my God, no! <laughs> More managers! <laughs> That's the opposite of what I intended. <laughs> the, the, the tagline is better management with fewer managers. Now I end up with more. I failed, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, so, well, I appreciate the message, of course. It's awesome. And these, I, I show you these because these messages are important for me. Um, I'm not trying to brag, I'm trying to show you what, 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 what I'm proud of, and that is me being complimented because of my writing. I'm trying to be an author, and these things are important. Yes, I like royalty statements from publishers. That's nice. <laughs> and yes, I like good reviews on, on Amazon, but such personal messages, they beat everything. And this is what I'm most, most, most proud of. And I show you that because sometimes people struggle with, with, with goals for companies, the purpose for organizations. I ask them sometimes, I did it last week, what is the purpose of your company? And it was very, very silent in that workshop that I had at that company. They started laughing. <laughs> hmm. And then somebody said, well, it was on, it was on, one, of the, on one of the slides that, that he showed this morning. <laughs> Okay, well then it's not working. <laughs> if you have to dig up a slide deck to check slide number 27 to see what the, what the purpose was. <laughs> Some kind of mission statement, probably. No, 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 that's not working. I tell them, what is it that you're most proud of? So they did a 10 minute extra. What is it that you're most proud of? Oh, they were easy. It was easy. They were able to tell me that. Some products that they made and, and, and some awards that they won. And then I said, well, why don't you turn that in a little exposition? A work exposition. That is the stuff that you, that you like doing. This is what you're most proud of as an organization together. So this is apparently your purpose. Uh, I have a picture here of a restaurant in, 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 the Silicon, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. It is a Persian restaurant. You see the theme, Iran? I don't know, no, no idea why. A Persian restaurant. And they were very proud of the awards that they won, the newspaper articles, and over here, a nice compliment handwritten note by one of the guests. They love that. That is what they, what, they, what they like doing. So apparently that is their purpose. They want to be the best Persian restaurant. So whenever 
<coughs> whenever people fail to form a community in the organization, when, the, when they don't know the purpose, and everyone knows it starts with why, as Simon Sinek said with his, uh, with his famous book, then why don't you look back and see what you're most proud of? That will give you an idea of what the purpose is of, of what you're doing together. If there's nothing to be proud of, well, then you have a problem. <laughs> then you need to, uh, need to feel, uh, need to change things so that there's something to be proud of, at least. Here's a picture that I took in Shanghai. Uh, another, another company, software company, lots of awards that they won. This is a picture I got from France. I have no idea what they're doing. What the fuck is going on there at that company? What is this little thing with this frock? Well, they're proud of it. <laughs> I compliment them for that. <laughs> so, um, anyways, so that's nice. I call it the work exposition. You can make a work exposition next week. You see how easy it is to start changing organizations? Just start doing these things. It's not that hard. You don't have to change other people. You can do this yourself. But I have more suggestions. <coughs> I, have this, uh, I have this book trailer that I have on, on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to show you here. You can, you can see it yourself if you want. And it was made by some very amazing animators, Marta and George in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, they, do, they did an awesome job. The script obviously was, uh, was uh, written by me. Uh, the illustrations were mine, but they did the animations. Uh, voice over by Paul, a great voice actor in, in New York. And the catering, obviously, that was done by me. is most of the important parts of the project, I would say. Um, and we call these credits. You're familiar with the principle, I'm quite sure. You just list names and the roles that people had on a project, and then you credit them for that role. It's very simple, very easy, <coughs> easy practice. I show you this because the, 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 the problem in, in, uh, in many organizations, um, or one of the problems in many organizations, is the career ladder. You know the idea? Yes, I some, see people, some people nodding their heads. So the career ladder, you can only grow in one direction, which is up, then you need to become a manager of something. And, and this, is, this is important for many people because there's no other way to earn more money and make progress and have a sense of identity uh, that is developing over time. Um, and, this, uh, uh, and this leads to one of the many problems this leads to is job title inflation, where people have titles such as senior vice president of the office supplies and things like that. It doesn't make much sense, in, I think. But, um, but we have to do something about that. We have to do something about it. What I do in my workshops, we did it yesterday uh, here in, in Barcelona. Uh, I have people come up with three different names. The middle one is their job title, and usually that's the boring one. You see that? This is an actual picture I took in my, my workshop. Half of the people were CEOs. Boring. <laughs> Anyone can register a company at the Chamber of Commerce and then you're CEO. Ta-da! Recruiters know that they can ignore this, basically. The titles that people have on LinkedIn, it is the most useless information that, that there is available about them. We should, you should ignore that part, the job title. What is interesting is how people express themselves. These are their work profiles, their personal brands, how, how people like to express themselves. Some people, uh, I call myself a creative networker. Others call themselves agile enthusiast or, or chief happiness officer or, or, or uh, common censor was on the board yesterday. I love those titles. This shows how awesome people are, how amazing they are and how different, remarkable. I love it. And here at the bottom is the actual roles, the contributions that people had on projects, things for which they can be credited. Like, I was a coach on that team, I was a project manager over there, I have been a developer for this platform or that product. That is actual contributions, the credits that you earn. Why do we need the one in the middle? I don't know. Actually, some companies have figured out that we don't need it if you have the other two. A famous one is Pixar Animation Studios. There's a great book about them, Creativity Inc. You should read it, it's awesome. And it, sh and it says that Pixar has no job titles. What they have is everyone can call themselves anything they want. 
you can print anything you want on your business card. If you want to call yourself chief happiness officer, go ahead, that's what you will be. That's fine, but everyone else is allowed to ignore it. But what we focus on is your actual contributions to projects, the credits that you earn. You have to be asked to participate in projects for the amazing uh, talents that you, that you have. So they have project roles, credits, obviously you see them at the end of the Pixar movies. You see the credits of who had been doing what, and that's most important for them. This works because people need two things in order to be happy. They need a sense of identity, self-expression, uh, some people call it self-actualization. Um, I think some of you are familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs. At the top is self-actualization. That is calling yourself anything you want because that makes you happy. And another uh, thing that has been proven by science is a sense of progress. People are happy when they feel that they move forward, that they achieve more. Now, this, this is my, this is my na uh, 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 role on a project. When I uh, write a book, I am the author. I am the author of the book. Now, no matter how many books I write, Amazon is going to call me author, not senior vice president of authoring <laughs> after 100 books. That makes no sense. Even book 100, I will be an author. Hopefully, it sells more. I have more ratings, more amazing messages from Betsy that I can put above my bed or something. So these are the more, more important things. The project role and the identity, the people's personal brands. If you focus on that, and you can start doing that next week, focus on the top and the bottom. Then over time, the importance of job titles, it will go away because people will feel happy about their roles and their and their identities. And you can get rid of the job titles, hopefully. Pixar does not have job titles. So if they can do it, you can do it well, as well. But there's more you can do. <coughs> there's more you can do. I did uh, my workshops all over the world. I tried to practice what I, what I preach. And uh, one thing I practiced, uh, and I failed at it, was self-organized workshops. I had this crazy idea of why don't people just register over here on this page and we keep a mailing list who registers and then we discuss with each other and I will ask the locals, um, please arrange a venue and, and some food and we'll make things happen. We'll keep it inform nice and informal and whatever. It will, it will be fun. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. I had self-organization, I thought, but it was not self-organizing. Uh, I remember in Brussels, uh, there was, uh, I had 12 people signed up, that was my second workshop, uh, 12 people signed up, and uh, two weeks before the event, I still had no venue, nobody was doing anything, and I became very nervous <laughs> as the facilitator. <laughs> I realized, okay, this self-organization thing, that was a nice experiment, doesn't work. I need to pull back the level of, of empowerment, basically, and decide for myself as the manager of this workshop. And, and that was a good learning experience. It doesn't always happen. And, and, and people tell me that, both managers and coaches. Sometimes they empower teams and they tell, okay, you're agile now, you can, you can do things by yourselves. And then nothing happens. Nothing happens, they're not self-organizing. And, and, and then the managers become desperate. You're on, what do we do? I gave them all the responsibility, autonomy, empowerment, all those words, I gave them. <laughs> Now nothing is happening, what do I do? Well, I say, why don't you create a delegation board? Uh, seven levels of delegation. You have to make it clear to, to everyone what the level of delegation is, what you expect. Level one is tell. I tell you that next month you will go on vacation from, from the 30th, from the 23rd to the 30th, and uh, that's dictatorship, basically, right? That's dictatorship. I will tell people what to do. But there are other levels as well. Selling is trying to convince you of the right idea. Three is, is asking you for your opinion first, but then I still decide, but I will hear you out. Level four is let's agree together. Level five is um, I will tell you what I want, but you can decide. You can ignore me, but you have to hear me first because I have some good ideas. Um, level six is do whatever you want, but you have to sell it to me afterwards. I will ask, what did you do? I'm paying attention to you guys. But you can do whatever you want. Level seven is, I don't want to even want to hear it. You're the professionals. You're just frying my brain with all that information. I trust you. So you see there are a number of levels of delegation. And you can turn that into a delegation board. You can visualize it. And, and that is very useful. 
I'm sure you're familiar with the issue, with, 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 the, with, the, with the, 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 the concept, I mean, of, of visualizing things. When we have problems with our workflow, we should visualize our workflow. We call it a scrum board, a Kanban board, or value stream mapping, different versions of it. But it's all visualizing the work. When we have a problem with self-organization, we should visualize it so that things become more clear. This is one way of doing that. You just have the, the seven levels of delegation, and this one, and this one says, well, that, was, that, that, that didn't work. The venue selection, that's level six. Just tell me what you did. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> in Brussels, it didn't work. In, in Berlin, it was the opposite. Uh, I read on Twitter that, they, that my workshop would, be, would happen at a company that I had never heard of before. They forgot to they inform me. <laughs> they applied delegation level seven. <laughs> I was completely out of the picture. <laughs> okay, that, well, that one didn't work either. So I had to make it more clear what I, what I needed. Uh, I have an example here of a company in, in, in Bulgaria that, uh, that sent this board to me. They have an interesting one. <laughs> I should ask what, they, what they're doing. Salaries at level six, interesting. <laughs> Okay, so apparently the team members can pay each other anything they want as long as they inform the manager. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Okay, curious. But, uh, oh well, whatever, if it works for them. But <clears throat> this is uh, visualizing where the boundaries are of self-organization. That is important. Uh, I always say that, uh, that, that the word management is from the Italian word maneggiare which means taking care of horses, leading horses. That's such a nice metaphor. The organization is like a horse, or the team is like a horse. I don't mean that the individuals look like horses, right? No, no, no. I mean the team is like a horse. And, in, and a fully self-organizing horse, that would be a wild horse. Um, managing a wild horse, that, that, that doesn't make much sense. I'm not going to sit on a wild horse and slap its ass and say, yeehaw, and then hope that it runs in the right direction. That's stupid management, I think. So no, you need the reins and the spurs and the bridles, and there should be a fence somewhere, and then you have to gain the trust. It is a living system. It has to trust you, or else it kicks you in the face. You have to earn that trust with the organization. And then make it clear to the horse where the boundaries are. It's very, very much the same thing. So that's what you can do with the delegation board. All right, I have more suggestions. <coughs> I have more suggestions. One thing that people ask me all the time, wherever I go, it was not on the list, but it's one of the most popular questions. Um, Jürgen, how do, we change, how do we measure the performance of teams? How do we measure the performance of teams so often? They ask me that question. And then I ask them, how do you measure your own performance? And then they are like, oh, this is too complex. You're um, measuring my performance? Are you kidding? I have a very, very, very complex job. No, 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 I, I cannot do that with just one metric, you idiot. No, 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 no. But I want to measure them. I want to measure them. I don't want to measure them, and then comparing them with them. Well, that's not entirely fair, I think. If you don't know how to measure yourself, then why do you believe you can measure other people? So why don't you start with measuring yourself? And that is what Google's OKR system is doing. It's a fascinating practice. You should look into it. There's a one-hour video of Google's OKR, but I'll give you the, the summary in, in, in one or two minutes. So the OKR stands for Objectives and Key Results. The objective is, for example, I want it to be a healthy runner in the last quarter. What is healthy? You cannot measure healthy. You have to find different metrics. Well, that is what the key results are for. So you define a couple of ways in which you're going to measure yourself. But they have to be multiple metrics, because one metric is often not enough. You need to look at a problem from different angles, like what is quality? You need multiple metrics. What is performance? You'll probably need to measure multiple things. So I said, okay, well, the key results, my targets will be, I want to run 75 kilometers per week, I want to run 10 kilometers per day, uh, average running time 55 minutes per 10K, and no pain anywhere, because I had been in a lot of pain end of June, and I said, never again. I wanted to be a healthy runner without pain. So those were my OKRs. 
And then at the end of the uh, three months, uh, that was uh, the 1st of October, I started evaluating myself. That's the end of the iteration, basically. The iteration is three months. And then you do a self-assessment. You evaluate yourself with, the, with scores. For the first one, well, I was running 50K, not 75K. I, 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 75 was apparently far too ambitious. I run that. Okay, so I give myself a 44%. Because I started with 30, ending up at 50, that's 44% of the increase that I intended. Um, I ran 10K, or actually I ran 12K uh, per run, three or, uh, or four times per week. So, yay, 100% on that one. The average running time, well, I, I participated in a race and it was 45 minutes and 25 seconds. Awesome! <laughs> So I had 100% uh, there as well. But to be fair, my left knee was slightly troubling me. It was not painful. It didn't hurt, but it was clearly sending me signals. Jürgen, can we please, please, please take it easy because this is going too fast. I'm going to kill you if you do this uh, uh, a few weeks more. So I gave myself 75. It's an honest self-assessment. There's no reason for me to game the system because I am the system. I'm trying to learn. So I said, okay, I'm um, 75. And then you take the average, and the average is 80. And that's a, a good score. That's a good score. You know what they say at Google? What is the optimal score? It's between 60 and 70. It's not 100. Because if you aim, if you achieve 100 at Google, they say it was too easy. You've not been stretching yourself uh, good enough. Aim higher next time. Aiming for uh, getting 100% means you, you're, you're being lazy. <laughs> so aim higher. If you get more, less than 50%, wow, that's a learning experience. How interesting. What can you learn from it? So uh, try to do better next time. Nobody's punishing you for scores. The scores are all open and transparent at Google, at Google all the KPI, all the OKRs, the, the metrics, everyone can look up each other's metrics. Uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page have their OKRs, they can look at scores, and everyone is collaborating basically, and, and influencing each other. And there's one important key, is no scores are used for performance appraisals, they're not used for bonuses, they're not used for salary increase. That would be stupid, because once you translate them to salary increase, of course everyone is going to aim for very, very easy objectives to get 100%. That's beside the point. At Google, they want everyone to learn. Like professionals, setting themselves targets and trying to achieve them. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. I think it's a great, uh, a great method. And it resonates very well with, with being agile and people measuring themselves. Instead of people measuring others, everyone is required to measure themselves. OKRs, great suggestion. So I have people sending me OKRs now over email, and then they have pictures from OKRs in my, in my workshops. Uh, be a good example to my organization. That is somebody's, somebody's uh, objective. And he wants to measure it with um, receive overall positive feedback. That should be made more measurable, but I understand what he means, but I don't see the metric still yet. This one is good. Improve test coverage to 80%. That's measurable. You can measure that. So these are often called stretch goals. These are often called smart goals. They should be the measurable, measurable ones. You can start with it next week, as I did. I've been blogging about it, and now people are even sending me their running OKRs. Oh, you inspired me with running, so these are my OKRs. What do you think of it? Oh, great. <laughs> Glad to inspire people not only in Agile, but also in, 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 in running. That's nice. So I call that the metrics ecosystem because there's no hierarchy. There's no hierarchy of metrics. It's just everyone is measuring themselves and trying to inspire and influence each other, and that's how we learn. That makes much more sense. If you want to know more, check out the, the video. Just Google for OKRs and on YouTube. Let's talk about books. Does anyone want to, is, is trying to write a book in this, uh, in this audience? Anyone, anyone, any authors here? Any writers? Any, any more? Okay, read and weep. This is my investment in the, in the workout book. So uh, the editing cost me 4,000. I, uh, I had three editors. I'm a bit weird. 
Um, I admit, that was an experiment, but this was worth the experiment. Um, Linda's travels around the world obviously cost a lot of money. <laughs> well, well deserved, I can only say. Um, I have a website, a video trailer, I, I told you about that, the copywriters uh, that I paid, etc., etc. And then labor, how do you, how do you estimate labor? Well, uh, about 1,000 hours of work, I think. 70, hours will be de uh, 70 euros will be decent for... Uh, for a quality writer, so I mean, the order of magnitude is about 100k, more or less. Could be, could be a, a smaller, bigger, doesn't matter. So that's the, that's the size of the project. So, how much do I earn? Hmm, it's free. <laughs> what a stupid business model. <laughs> oh, this is not entirely true anymore. The Kindle version is out now since two months, and that I have a paper version uh, now. So finally, it's, there's some income uh, that I'm, uh, I'm getting. But by far, still not enough for the 100K. But of course, I have, my, I have another business, a business model will totally relies on, on, on Angel getting me, getting me participants for my workshops. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> That's how I pay Linda. <laughs> so uh, I show you this because I'm, I'm transparent. I don't mind. It helps people, it helps people learn. I'm, I'm, I'm total, totally in favor of transparency. I don't care. And I believe in transparency in organizations as well. Financial transparency. Yeah. Uh, including compensation. I, I, I've heard that, uh, I've, I've read several times in HR documents, because sometimes I come across HR websites in my research, and then it says things like, um, uh, compensation should be kept uh, confidential. This should not be told to anyone how much you pay to people. And I think, well, I can imagine only one reason. You don't want anyone to find out that they're being screwed. That's the reason for keeping things a secret, I think. I'll give you an example. I was, I was CIO for seven years. I was doing a good job, apparently, with the software developers because at one point they also gave me the project managers and the business consultants. My, my CFO said, here they are, now they're your problem. Good luck. Uh, okay, wow. So I then became responsible for their compensation and I looked at the numbers and I compared them with the software developers and thought, hmm, something is fishy here. And then I started making a, a salary formula. I reverse engineered a salary formula based on their education levels, job experience, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, 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 previous work experience, etc. And then I had a formula that was very close to their actual salaries and it basically said that everything else being equal, the project managers and the business consultants on average earned more than the software developers. I was furious. Livid would be a better word, maybe even. And I, th I thought it was not fair. This was not fair. And if I ask people over the, uh, around the world, what is the most important requirement for compensation? Nine out of ten times people say it should be fair. One out of ten times they say it should be more. Well, of course. But it should be fair, primarily. Well, that is not fair, I think. I don't think it, there was an intention behind it. I don't think it was a, there was a secret thing going on, no conspiracy. I don't believe that. It just emerged in the system, this difference. There was a good reason for that. It's very similar to the reason why, on average, all over the world, women get paid slightly less than men. And that is because, well, there's a very complex uh, uh, topic, of course, but one of the main problems is that it was published in Harvard Business Review a half a year ago or so, that women are great negotiators for other people. Men are very good negotiators for themselves. That is a main difference. I'm generalizing here, of course. We're talking about averages, but this emerged out of research. So women do great at the market when they need to haggle for their families, better than men. Men do very well in salary negotiations for themselves, better than women. So it is not a negotiation skill that differs, it is for whom you are negotiating. And salary systems, traditionally, they are created by men and favoring people who are able to negotiate for themselves. That happens to be men. And then women are asked to play the men's game. I think that's not entirely fair. I think that's not fair. 
And I think that was the same problem with the software developers versus the project manager business consultants. Because we hired those project manager business consultants because of their negotiation skills. They had to negotiate scope and requirements and, and, and budgets and all that stuff. Software developers, not so much. Because negotiation requires social conversations. Ooh, scary. Scary. We hired them for other talents, not the social dimension. So obviously they got paid less because they couldn't negotiate well. I believe we should get rid of the whole negotiation thing and I'm inspired by companies who have salary formulas. Just explain to people how they're getting paid. These are the variables that influence salary. Take it or leave it. We're not going to negotiate. That keeps things fair then you have people in your organization who like fairness instead of people who like negotiating for themselves. Buffer is a famous example. They published their salary formula uh, on, on their blog in, in December. After they published it, they got three times as many job applicants after they published it. And it contains things like uh, cost of living. Where do you live? In Manhattan or outside of Manhattan? Because the cost of living is higher within, uh, on the Manhattan island. I think that is relevant for compensation, all right? That's their culture, they decide. So they got three times as many job applicants. Um, and that is, I think, because of this perceived fairness to compensation. People like that. Um, <coughs> so salary formulas. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm making one right now, this week, with my, with my, new, uh, with my new team members. Uh, one thing uh, we were discussing was cost of living yesterday and then commitment level, because we don't calculate the number of hours per week. That's, that's so 20... 20th century. We have remote workers. I don't care how many hours people work, but I care about how committed they are to the organization. So you simply define the variables and then that's it. No negotiation. Take it or, take it or leave it. That's one part of, uh, of, uh, of composition. The other part is what people find most interesting. The bonus money. The extra stuff that is available every now and then. So suppose you have this fixed salary, hopefully done with the salary formula, uh, but that's up to you to decide if you're able to change that. But then what about the extra stuff that is sometimes available? The traditional approach is that maybe once per year near Christmas, uh, the manager decides how much is available and decides who gets which part. And there's one thing that you know for sure, and that is that everyone is going to hate that manager except the one who got the most. That is the traditional system. Everyone's going to dislike the results. Everyone thinks that they earn more, that they deserve more. Well, I think that's not, uh, that's, that's not correct because research shows that people overestimate their own contributions to, to any team or project or whatever. If you ask drivers how well they drive, then 70% think they are above average drivers. Right? makes no sense. Among college professors, it has been shown that 80% of college professors think they are above average. They are smart people. They should understand what an average means in a bell curve and like 50%. Among keynote speakers, it is 90% think that they are above average. 90%, I'm quite sure. So you shouldn't use that information, how people think they perform themselves. But we are very keen observers of how other people perform. That is much more useful information. We're very good at judging and evaluating people around us. So use that information. So I am inspired by companies such as uh, Linden Labs, the creators of Second Life, Shopify.com, uh, Cocoon Projects in, in Italy. They have a merit money system. What does it mean? Well, there is money available, there's a budget, and then everyone gets an equal amount. It's a bit like a vote. In a democracy. Everyone has the same vote, the same amount, but you can't vote on yourself. You have to give it to other people, that bonus money. And then let the games begin. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. So I could decide to give half of my bonus money to you, because you helped me out last week, uh, last month, when I was feeling depressed, because you killed my Tamagotchi. I hate you for that. 
So I'll give you half of my bonus money. You help me through. I was I was call I was prepared to call in sick for the next six months, but I'm still here thanks to your efforts, and I will split the rest of my bonus money equally among all my team members, except you, of course. I can do that. I can do that because <laughs> it's my little part of the bonus money. It's my vote. But you have your way of voting, <laughs> and you have your way of voting. Everyone has their own way of voting. And, uh, and we practice this at Happy Melly, my business, uh, my business uh, that I'm working on right now. We have credits. We call them hugs. Every, every month we have 100 hugs and we are expected to distribute them among each other. 10 hugs for you, 12 hugs for you, 15 hugs for you, with reasons why we credit each other. It works amazingly well, I can tell you. It is measurable uh, how, how well we appreciate each other's contributions to the, to the network. And it is sometimes, yes, it can be a disillusionment that people think that what you did was not as good as you thought yourself. All right, learn, learn. There are several uh, effects this has, as we noticed. Um, one is that uh, we pay better attention. We are expected to credit each other at the end of the month, so you better have good reasons with, for crediting each other. I sometimes credit people for showing up on Hangouts, sometimes for the things that they taught me for example. I keep it unpredictable how I distribute my credits. Another thing is uh, we work out loud. We, we, we communicate better about what we're doing. Like, hey everyone, I just fixed this problem on the website. Did you notice? I hope you remember by the end of the month. It was a lot of work. So we work out loud, as it is called. Better communication in the team. I see no problem there. I get two questions all the time from people all over the world. What about, um, what if two people exchange all their credits? What if they give each other all their hugs? My answer is, what does this say about the culture of your organization? If you expect that people are going to cheat, you have another problem to fix first, like uh, lack of values, lack of integrity. It's not going to, a, a transparent crediting system is not going to solve it, it's just going to show you. As people say with Scrum, Scrum is not solving your problems, it's just like your mother-in-law, only pointing at your problems. Just, you have to fix them. Right? But it's nice for them to be visible. It's the same with, with crediting uh, each other. Some people say, well, doesn't this become a popularity contest? Some people get all the credits because they're popular. I say, yes, you already have a popularity contest with the old system. It is called kissing the boss's ass. That's the popularity contest you have now. Because he is the one who has all the money. And the one who is best at kissing his ass gets the most. You just democratize that. You have to kiss a lot of asses in the whole company. <laughs> it's a full-time job, I can tell you, from personal experience. Your lips will turn blue, my God, it's so... Jeez, every minute I'm wondering who can I kiss now? Well, that's democracy, yes. Uh, it, it, I don't, I'm not saying democracy is perfect, but nobody has yet found a better system, so we'll deal with the issues as we go along the way. It's better than dictatorship, at least. And I don't want to be the manager that is hated by everyone because I distribute the mo bonus money incorrectly. I just say, this is the amount, it's your problem now. Good luck. Much easier that way. So Lisette, my colleague, says uh, it works. Uh, in the beginning, she hated it, but now it works because uh, we complement each other. We pay attention to different things, and I, I really, I really agree agree to that. So you could have a salary formula, and on top the merit money system, or make any kind of combination. At, at Cocoon projects, they only have the merit money thing. That's very fascinating. Anyone can join that organization. You're just not getting a salary. You need to earn your credits. You earn your credits because of the things that you do. Uh, and that's uh, an amazing way of paying people. All right, last uh, two minutes. <clears throat> I'll make it three, I'll cheat. Sorry. So uh, this, uh, this illustration I made base, uh, based on the book by Donald Reinson, Principles of Product Development Flow. Maybe some of you have seen it, uh, have, uh, have read the book. I'd be amazed because it's almost unreadable. He is so intelligent. Donald Ryanson, nobody understands what he means. <laughs> He's ten times smarter than I am, as I always say, but I am ten times better illustrator than Donald is. And, and he doesn't agree because he says, I am 100 times better illustrator. But, so that's a small detail. But 
I illustrated what he was trying to convey in his book. And he said, um, learning from, uh, when people say celebrate failure, that doesn't make much sense. I hear that at your conference all the time. We should celebrate failure. Nonsense. No. We should celebrate learning. That's the middle part of this diagram. The learning happens as a result of running experiments. When you do something and you don't know if it's going to work or not, like I tried with self-organized workshops. Well, nice idea, didn't work. Was worth trying, was worth trying. So I failed, but I learned. That is the reason for celebrating. I left this little, little man bag, my man bag, I left it on the plane three times already. I left it on trains, I left it in conference hallways, in hotel rooms, everywhere. I tell you, I'm not kidding, I left it in Barcelona on a big square, busy square, where I've been drinking, and five minutes later, we went away, and five minutes later, oh my God, my bad, it's gone, again. We had to run back, it was still there. Thank you very much, people in Barcelona, <laughs> for not taking the bag. <laughs> That was the a hundred times. I'm not learning, I'm just being an idiot. That is, that is the red part. Failure from being stupid. Don't celebrate that. Makes no sense. The other part, the green part on the, on the, uh, on the for me left, for you the right, that's good practices, repeating good practices. That is worth celebrating as well. Doing a good thing. We should compliment people for that. So the green part I call uh, the, the celebration area. That is worth uh, celebrating. Um, I'll skip through these, the, these examples. I'll, these are some, some pictures I took from, uh, from uh, workshops all over the, uh, over the world. Some people send, uh, send me the pictures because this is a great retrospective tool. At the end of the sprint, just draw a celebration grid. And instead of asking, what should we start doing, stop doing, continue doing? Boring questions. Why don't you draw the grid? say, well, these are the new experiments that we should be running. We should drop them in here and see if they are a success or a failure. If they're a success, then they move over here and then become good practices. If they fail, they move over here, and doing them again would be a stupid mistake. That's how a, a celebration grid uh, works. All right, last, uh, last example. <coughs> I introduced uh, uh, a way to celebrate something in the last company where I worked a couple of years ago where I told the CEO that um, we never celebrated anything. We should celebrate something whenever the great project delivered or a new customer acquired. And he said, okay, what do you suggest? I said, well, why don't we have a, a ship's bell or something? That makes a lot of noise because we had a big open office space. I thought, well, that would be cool, have make, having something that makes noise. All right, he said. Then I forgot about it, and two weeks later, he came to my desk with a big, copper ship's bell. It was this bell. I took a picture of it. It was this bell. He came to my desk and said, here's your bell. Now do something useful with it. I said, oh my God. <laughs> a ship's bell. So I went to the office police. Uh, sorry, I mean the office manager. Um, and I asked her to put the bell in the middle of the office. And I sent an email from now on. Anyone is allowed to ring the bell, but we will expect you to explain what is there to celebrate and cookies or cake would be nice. And from that moment, every few weeks or so, somebody rang the bell and it made a huge fucking noise in the office. And 150 people, 200 people came from several floors, because you could hear it all over, came to the coffee machine, and then the person who rang the bell stood there waiting for everyone to assemble and explained why he or she rang the bell. And then, of course, everyone was waiting for him or her to finish so that we could get the cookies or the cake. And the last time I heard the bell was when the CEO explained that I had just quit my job. It's true. It's true. So, these are practices that anyone can introduce next week. I hope some of you feel inspired by trying at least one or two of them. They will be your experiments. See if they work for you. They might succeed, they might fail. And they're all in this book. There's a Kindle version, a free PDF, but now also a very very, very heavy, one kilogram version of it, this one. People complain about the shipping costs. Well, that's because it's more than one kilogram. <laughs> My God, I made it heavy intentionally. Because if all these practices fail, then at least what you can do, you can throw it at your manager. All right? Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>